Good afternoon, YouTube friends. This is Recovering Yankee, and I'm here to do another video. Today, my video will be a biblical topic. You might ask, Recovering, I remember you were doing all this weight loss, and you were demonstrating your weight loss. Why did you stop doing those, those videos? Great question. Thank you for asking. Okay, the reason I stopped doing those videos is because, uh, like a typical beta male, I have been uh, doing the diet, losing weight, violating the diet, gaining the weight back, going back on the diet, losing the weight, violating the diet, gaining the weight back, etc., 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 and I'm sick of I'm sick of having no willpower, so I have to work on myself in order to get my willpower back, so that I can start losing weight and continue to lose it and not break the diet and start that cycle again. So I don't feel like being a continual failure when it comes to weight loss. So I will do that at a later time. Now, why why am I? You might say. Oh, recovering? Why are you doing all these biblical topics now? You like recently you just did all those idol breaking topics. Good good question. Thank you for asking. Okay. A few months ago, the uh, uh rancher in Texas was able to give birth to five red heifers that stayed red. And they're still red to this day. As a result of that, and as a result of various scriptures in the Tanakh, also known as the Old Testament, there are um, verses that say that the red heifer is sacrificed at the age of three years, no more than three years old. Now, these red heifers are red. The, mess, the Messianic age will begin with the, with the Messiah making red heifers, or making a sacrifice of red heifers. So, it's a possibility that these red heifers are the red heifers that will be sacrificed by the mess, during the Messianic age. Uh, Maimonides, who's one of the most famous uh, rabbinic Jewish people in the history of rabbinic Judaism uh, wrote that nine red heifers were sacrificed before his time and that one more would be sacrificed after his time which is the Messianic age so it's a strong possibility well, extremely strong possibility that I fully adhere to the Messianic age will start before those red heifers turn three years old which, if they're about a year and a half now, you can do the math. Three minus a year and a half is a year and a half. That means you have about a year and a half to go. Okay? Which means they could start building the temple in in uh, Jerusalem within the next year and a half. The Messianic Age could start. The war of Gog and Magog could happen against Israel within the next year and a half, etc. So... My goal, if you will allow me to have a goal, is to teach three groups of people and anyone else that wants to listen and all the Gentiles in the world, which in the Bible are called Goyim. Okay? My goal is to get these people ready for the Messianic Age. Now you might say, well, recovering, I'm ready because I'm a Christian. Or, I'm ready because I'm Messianic. Or, I'm ready because I'm a rabbinic Jew. That's not true. You guys have false doctrines and false teachings. You have a pantheon of gods. You have idols. And you, all three of you, borrow heavily from pagan religions. So... I don't think you're ready. Therefore, 
I have taken out the burden myself. I have taken the burden upon myself to start teaching you guys how to properly interpret the scriptures, how to get rid of your idols, and how to turn to Adonai Yahuwah, and how to serve him according to the Torah written by Moses. The rabbinic Jewish people are not serving according to the Torah written by Moses. They're serving a book known as the Oral Law or the Talmud. The Christians are not serving according to a book, the Torah written by Moses. The Christians are serving according to a book known as the New Testament. And the Messianics are the same way. So, today, I'm going to teach you some basics about how to use the Strong's Concordance in your studies and why it's important. So first, let me read a brief history, one paragraph associated with the Strong's Concordance and its founder, James Strong, professor. According to the preface of, of the Strong's Concordance, it says, in 1890, Dr. James Strong, a professor of exegetical theologic, a professor of exegetical theology at Drew's Theological Seminary, published his monumental concordance to the Holy Scriptures. The fruit of 35 years of labor by Dr. Strong and more than 100 colleagues, his volume has since become the most widely used concordance ever compiled from the King James Version of the Bible, still the standard English version of the Bible. Assembled without the aid of computers or other electronic devices, Strong's has stood the test of time and confirmed that Professor Strong's vision for a complete, simple, and accurate concordance that would become a permanent standard for purposes of reference. And the information there, of course, comes from Publisher's Preface, preface the New Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, ISBN 0-8407-5360-8. What is the primary function of the strong concordance of the Bible? The function is to enable the reader of the scriptures to locate any scripture passage in the King James Version, as well as every Hebrew or Greek word behind the English words. And that comes from the instructions to the reader, the New Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, same ISBN number. Now, uh, there are several world-class, extremely well-written resource materials that are keyed to Strong's Concordance numbers, and I'll talk about those in a minute. But first, I want to show you my copy of the Strong's Concordance. You'll see how old it is. It's from 19... It came out... It was printed in 1984. And you can see it's starting to rip in different pages. I've turned it so many times... The binding is not really holding on tight anymore, so things have to uh, be replaced eventually. But right now, it's still good. Oh, wrong thing. So, this is my copy of the Strongest Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible. Okay, you see all the pages are folded down, and there's rips, and I have tape everywhere to hold the Bible together. Here's more that's falling apart again. And you can see the shiny tape. Okay, this is the Strong's Concordance. And um, let me show you basically how to use it. I figured I would look up a word, and the word is anointed, or to anoint. anoint. And here it is. This is the main body of the concordance, okay? At the back of the concordance, which I'll show you in a minute... The main dictionary body is the Hebrew and Greek dictionaries, okay? But for now, what you do is you, you're doing a study. You pick a keyword that you want to look up. In this case, the word is going to be anoint, okay? Or anointed. What Strong's does is it lists every single word that is in the entire scriptures. And it locates each and every word with respect to a particular chapter or verse of a book in the Bible. So, 
Now, in the in the introduction, I mentioned that the Strong's Concordance is oriented toward the King James Bible. Okay. The Strong's Concordance is oriented toward many versions of the Bible. This my particular Strong's Concordance is oriented toward the King James Bible. At the time when I learned about this concordance, I was going to a Christian church as a Christian. I needed to learn to study the scriptures. I did not know how to learn to study the scriptures. I only knew to just read the scriptures. So uh, a bookstore introduced me to the Strong's Concordance. And they asked me, what Bible do you use at your church? I told them the King James, so they gave me a King James-oriented concordance. However, if I had told them that I, my church honors the New International Version of the Scriptures, then they would have given me a, a strong concordance that's keyed to the New International Version. Or if I had told them that we use a Revised Standard Version, then they would have given me a concordance oriented toward Revised Standard Version. Many, not all, but many versions of the Scriptures come with a concordance that's oriented to that Scripture that version okay so the idea is that you're doing a, a study you have to look up a keyword you may not know where the keyword is but you know the keyword in this case is anoint okay or anointed but you just don't know where it's located so what is it what do you do you go to the concordance body and you look up your keyword in this case anoint or anointed Okay, and you can see down the list you have all these passages, um, which is called the uh, the con. These are called context lines. Okay, this is the book of the of the scripture that has that context, that keyword. This is the verse number, and this is the concordance reference number. Okay, so maybe you're trying to think of verses that talk about. To anoint the priest. Okay. Well, you go into the word anoint. You read through the context lines. The first one says, and shall anoint. You see the A there? That is the word anoint. And shall anoint them and consecrate. Or, uh, no, that's not the verse I'm looking for. Let's see. Let me, let's see the next one. Pour it upon his head and anoint him. Okay, that's the one I want right there. Okay, you'll see right here it says, pour it upon his head and anoint him. That's a shortened version of the passage in the scriptures. You'll see that it's in Exodus chapter 29, and the colon means verse 7. And you'll see this number right here, 4886. It is not, you'll notice that it is not italicized. Now, just to show as an example of what I mean by italicized, Going above anoint, you see the word before it is anas. Anas has New Testament references, Luke, John, John, Acts, etc., etc. And you see the number 452, that is italicized. Okay, if you see the italicized number, that means it's in the Greek dictionary at the back of the concordance. If you see a number like this that is not italicized, it means it's in the Hebrew concordance. Now, occasionally you will find, let me see if I can find, oh, here's one right here. You will find a word, in this case it's the word another, which has a blank space where the number should be. That blank space means that there is no word, that word was not originally in the Hebrew or the Greek text. It was added in by the translator. So in, in Genesis 42.1, the word another was added in by the translator because it's not in the Hebrew or the Greek text. Okay. So now that gives you the definite that gives you the location of the keyword that you're trying to, to, to study. In this case, it's Exodus 29.7. The keyword is 4886 in the Hebrew Dictionary. So now what you do is you go to the Hebrew Dictionary, which is at the back of the concordance, 
and you go to 4886. Because that's the keyword number, right? 4886. Almost there. Four eight eight six. Now, right next to it, same. This is the same in the Greek or the Hebrew text. Okay. Right next to it is the Hebrew letters that say that spell the word four eight eight six, which is anointed or to anoint. Mem, shin, chet. That's how it's written in modern Hebrew. Then, right here, it says Mashiach. Uh, these, this is the transliteration of that, using the main letters, the mem, shin, and the chet. Mem, a, a, m, a, mem, shin, s, h, chet, c, h. Next, you look here, you see the English phonetic pronunciation, moshak. And then after that, you have the various definitions and meanings of that word. Okay? Moshak. 4886. Okay. It's a primitive root to rub with oil, i.e. to anoint. By implication, to consecrate, also to paint. Now you notice this dash right here. Okay? Dash. This is the way that King James renders the word anoint or paint okay now uh, you'll also notice that some of these other words see remember 4886 is mem shin chet look at 4887 also mem shin chet and look at 488 Mem Shin Chet with an A, a He at the end. Mem Shin Chet with a He at the end again. 4889. See the Mem Shin Chet again? 4890. Mem Shin Chet. 4891. Mem Shin Chet. 4892. Mem Shin Chet. In other words, all those words that I just mentioned, all by number, are in the same family of roots. That's something you have to learn if you want to learn to speak and understand and read Hebrew. Family of roots. It stops here at M4894, Memshim Tet. It's no longer Memshim Chet. It's Memshim Tet. So all those words I just mentioned are related by family of roots. Now, there are several books that you can buy on the market that are keyed to strong concordance. This one is called Gesinius, Hebrew Chaldee Lexicon to the Old Testament. Again, the Old Testament is also known as a Tanakh in Hebrew. Okay. Now, this book is specializes in one thing. First of all, let me tell you about Justinius. Justinius is a genius person. He is very brilliant. He was very dedicated to the truther movement that existed in his time. He wanted to have a lexicon that was easy to read and easy to understand based on King James, uh, the Strong's Concordance numbers. And uh, it would allow the student to uh, find out how that word is used throughout the scriptures. King James... When they, remember I mentioned the part where the few words after the dash mark tell you how King James renders the word? Well, Justinius goes through each and every single verse where that word is used and gives you a, a basic understanding of how that word is used in the Tanakh. Or in the New, oh, well, the Tanakh, because it's the Old Testament. So you'd go to 4886. You see the numbers here? Those are the numbers for Strong's Concordance. So you've got to go to 4886, so I'm 47, 47, 40, I'm too far, 4912, 
4855. Okay, it's got to be right here somewhere. 4886. Okay. Now, there's the Mem Shim Chet again. And as you read through this, you'll see it means to stroke in some verses. It means to draw the hand over in other verses. To spread over with anything, especially to lay color. In other words, it's a, it's a more um, well-pronounced and definitive uh, definition than Strong. Strong's gives a very brief definition of what the word means. Okay, Justinius helps you to understand it and helps you how each verse breaks down the word mem shin chet or forty-eight eighty-six. Okay, that's a that's a why Justinius is so good. The next book that you can use for study purposes is the Brown Driver's Briggs Brown Driver Briggs Hebrew and English Lexicon Coded with Strong's Concordance Numbers okay this book specializes another one of the top three or top four top five Bible study books in the world because this one teaches you how to actually understand Hebrew grammar Sentence structure, parts of speech, verb forms, noun forms, adjectives, adverbs, etc. This is a very, very, very good book to have. Uh, the book that I like to use with respect to... Oh, that's not something I'm looking for. The book that I like to use with respect to studying is a book by... A uh, man named Jeff Denner. It is the Paleo Hebrew Lexicon, the ancient Hebrew lexicon of, to, of the Bible. Hebrew letters, words, and roots defined within their ancient cultural context. This is a, a long term discussion about the function of Hebrew words and the image that each letter represents. Okay? Ancient Paleo-Hebrew is a pictographic language where each letter represents a picture. In modern Hebrew, as you can see from some of these words, these letters are just square and blocky. You have a, a mem, a resh, a yud, a resh, a wa, and a tav, okay? Those letters have no picture value. But words in the Paleo language, each letter is a picture. In the Paleo language, that's an Aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You see the Aleph right there? I get a pen so I can point to this. See the Aleph in the, in the Paleo Hebrew? It looks like an ox head, right? This is the Aleph in the modern Hebrew. It doesn't look like anything. It's a nun in this, in this particular word. It's a seed sprout. This nun right here just doesn't have any image. Then you have the shin right here, which is two teeth. And over here you have the shin, which is no no picture again. If you want to know what is similar to ancient Paleo-Hebrew, you would go to A, the language of China, India, Thailand, etc. They're all pictures. You would go to the North American and South American Indian tribes, which use pictures. You'd go to Egyptian hieroglyphics, which is pictures. Now, basically, ancient Paleo-Hebrew is the least sophisticated of all the picture languages. Chinese is the most sophisticated with respect to all the picture languages. That's very, very important because all the Shemites, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all the Shemites... We're using ancient Paleo-Hebrew thousands of years ago when Noah and his family got off the ark. And they can, the Shemites to this day are still continuing to use the ancient, a, a paleo type of language, a pictographic language. Which means that, or strongly implies and strongly infers that the people in the Far East that have picture languages, China, Japan, India, Thailand, etc., are Shemites. 
that the Egyptians, the Israelites, are Shemites, that the North American and South American Indians are also Shemites, okay? As compared to them being Japhethites, which would be the uh, another group of people that live in the world, and the Hamites, which is another group of people. Okay, now, this book is keyed to Strong's Concordance as well, Benner's book. I've already taken the liberty of opening it up to... 4886. Now, what you do with Benner's book is you look up 4886 in the first column here. You see, you have column one, column two, column one, column two, column one, two, etc. Look up 4886, which is right here, and you'll see that it says 2357 Victor. Okay, 2357 Victor is the family, is part of the family where that word is described. So now you turn in your in this Benner book to 2357 Victor, which I've already taken the liberty to find. Oh, I lost it. 2357 Victor. I apologize. Okay, 2357 Victor right there. Now here's 2357. 2357 Victor. And there's the word Mem Shin Chet. With the paleo equivalent letters, mem is the waves of water, shin is two teeth, and chet is a wall that separates the tent from the male side and the female side. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this. If I did, I apologize. If I did not, each letter in the paleo is a picture, and each picture has its own meaning. And it always is associated with the function of the object or the function of the thing. Like, for instance, like I mentioned, the tent wall. You see that little, the three lines with the two lines on top? Okay, I'm going closer. Right here, the tent with the three lines, three vertical lines and two horizontal lines. Right, let me get the phone up. That's the chet, okay? It's a tent wall that separates the male and the female section of the tent. Then you have the shin, which is two teeth. Pressure, it puts pressure down. When you bite, it's putting pressure down on whatever you're biting. And the mem is waves of water. So, Hebrew thought, or Eastern thought, Middle Eastern thought, I mean, is based on the function of a word. If you hand a Hebrew-speaking person or a Hebrew-cultured person a pen, they know that it is a pen, they write with it. If you hand the Greek thinking person the same pen, they would take out a, a tape measure and measure the length. They would measure the diameter with a micrometer. They'd measure the weight with a scale. And they would uh, describe and define each at particular aspect of the pen. Oh, it's round. It's a quarter inch diameter round. It is approximately 4.6 inches long. It has a point on the end that allows ink to come out. Oh, and by the way, it writes. <laughs> the uh, Eastern thinking, the Middle Eastern, the Far Eastern, and the, and the American Indian thinking is not that it it's four inches long and three inches in diameter or whatever, it weights so much. It's that it's a pen and it writes. Okay? So, now you can look through 2357 Victor and you'll find that the primary family meaning of the word is ointments were made from oils and smeared on injuries for healing. Oil was also sm smeared on the heads of individuals who are being given the office of a prophet, priest, or king as a sign of authority. Okay. Now, the um, victor means it's a verb. And you have to know about the verb forms. I'll have to get out Brown Drivers Briggs again. Okay? But in this case, it's a verb. If it was a 2357 November, it would be a noun. And then there's another noun form here, 2357 November, Foxtrot. Then you go here, then you have 2357 Bravo, which could be a noun form or an adjective form or a verb form. 
You have to read it, find out each definition, what it, what it implies, okay? But using 2357 Victor, and we know the pronunciation of 23, of 4886 in the Strong's Concordance is Mashiach, right? Or Mashiach, which is also the word for the word Messiah. And that's why I picked this word. The verb form of Messiah means to schmear. Like you have a bagel and you smear cream cheese on it. Smear cream cheese. Uh, you have uh, soap out of a soap jar and you smear it all over your hands. Okay? In this case, it has to be smearing with oil as a treatment or as a sign of authority. So the function of the word Mashiach, the verb function, is to smear. You smear the oil on the head of the of the anointed person. That means to smear. So anoint means to smear. And that's how you get the definitions of words. So what is the function of the messianic person with respect to the verb form? How do you know if a person is a messianic person? Some Christians will say that Jesus was anointed. The question that you would have to ask logically is who smeared oil on the head of Jesus? There's no evidence that there was oil smeared on his head. In the New Testament, it says that the Spirit came down on his head and anointed him like a dove. Okay, But that's still not the same as smearing oil on his head. The various priests in the Tanakh and the Torah... Aaron and Aaron's sons were all smeared with oil on their head by Moses. And then later on, Moses did not smear all the priests. Moses smeared Aaron and his sons. And then later on, I imagine that Aaron and his sons were responsible for smearing oil on the other heads of the other priests. Okay? And that carried on through history. The high priest smeared the oil on the lower priests. Okay, so anyway, that's just the basic of how to use the Strong's Concordance. The Strong's Concordance is the major tool you need to use in order to uh, get meaning of words, definitions of words with uh, respect to roots, definitions in parts of speech with respect to verb forms and noun forms, adjectives and adverbs, parts of speech, sentence structure, grammar, etc. All stems from Strong's Concordance, and these handful of books that I just mentioned. Now you know how to use. Now, one last thing I want to tell you about the Strong's Concordance. Is the Strong's Concordance is like a cannon in a battle. Or a howitzer. Against false teachings and false doctrines. Remember I said earlier that... Christians have a habit of adopting pagan culture, pagan symbols, pagan customs, and pagan deities. And I also mentioned that rabbinic Jews and messianic believers have the same habit, where they adopt paganism from various pagan cultures, and they, adopt, they assimilate it into their own religion. Yes. The way to find out that these doctrines or teachings are false, the way to find out that your minister has been lying to you or your rabbi has been lying to you, the way to find out that their teachings are fake is with a concordance. It's the greatest tool you could have to help you put a shield on yourself to prevent false doctrines and false teachings from coming in, to prevent paganism from coming in. So think of the concordance, the strong concordance, when you think of Star Trek, the next generation. Whenever they were, whenever the Enterprise was confronted with some kind of alien entity that did not um, follow Federation rules, Riker would say, shields up, red alert. Okay? Now, the concordance is shields up. When your minister is teaching you some pagan thing and you're not aware of what he's teaching you, 
Shields up, open the concordance. When your minister is saying something that you may not know how to study or may not know how to research, shields up, go to the concordance. We had this minister came to my, when I was going to the, when I was involved in Christianity, not involved in Christianity anymore. That was a phase of my life. He came to our church and he claimed, obviously, that the Holy Spirit told him this, okay? I found so many examples of where the Holy Spirit lies like a rug. Okay, but anyway, he claimed that the Holy Spirit told him that the names of the various patriarchs from Noah, from Adam to Noah, and from Noah to Jesus have a meaning for their name. And then he proceeded to give us a sermon about the meaning of their name and how it all turns into this big sentence, all portraying the future Jesus. Okay. So, at the time, I was, I used to carry the concordance with me to church. So this traveling pastor who came to our church and was allowed to speak at our church for a, a, at least an hour and a half or two hours, as he would read these names, as he would say these names, and he would tell you the definition of that name, I was quickly looking up the name in the concordance. A hundred percent of the names that he used in the definitions that he gave did not match the name in the concordance or the definition given in the concordance. At, a, at the end of his, his little sermonette or message or teaching, uh, I raised my hand. And I said, uh, I said to my pastor in front of this pastor, this fake pastor, who was a traveling pastor, I said, uh, Pastor, as this man gave the names of each of the patriarchs and the definition of each of their names, I looked up each name in the concordance. The definition given in the concordance of every single name that this pastor standing next to you uh, presented is not correct according to the concordance. And I said, Pastor, in other words, he made it up. Well, they didn't like that very much because I was confronting the traveling pastor. They definitely didn't like that at all. <laughs> so I became, with this book, it was shields up, red alert, Riker from Star Trek. And this book allowed me to become a howitzer to that pastor's false teaching. And then what happened is, after a while, I was going to the, every time I'd go to the church, they have any kind of sermon. I don't care what it was. I was reading, I was flipping through a concordance and getting the definitions of everything. And as soon as I'd find the definition of what the person said was false, hands up, pastor, that's a lie. That's not according to what the text says. And I would do it again and again and again and again. After a while, the pastor said to me, Scott, don't ever bring that book to my church again. <laughs> because his, sermon, his sermons were becoming ineffective because I kept correcting him throughout his sermon. He didn't like that very much. He wants to have the ability to present false doctrines and false teachings. He wants to control his sheep because he knows they're not going to look it up for themselves. And when he was confronted by this howitzer known as Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and the soldier, i.e. recovering Yankee, who was using the howitzer, he didn't like that very much because I was taking away his, his business function I was taking away his ability to earn money because when people kept seeing me correcting the pastor's errors, they didn't want to stay in the church any longer, so they left. So that's why he was getting very mad. Two reasons. A, because I was taking away his money, and B, because I was correcting him when he's supposed to be the, the man of God. Ooh. Okay. Now, I've had this discussion that I'm about to tell you with various ministers from the rabbinic Jewish assemblies, known as rabbis, and various ministers from 
a care right assemblies who are known as care right teachers they've asked me well well scott why would you use christian resources to come up with your understanding of things i said you know that's a great question thank you for asking the answer is this the rabbinic jews don't have resources such as a dictionary, lexicons, etc. And the Karaites don't have resources, concordances, lexicons, etc. So in, the, in those two religions, you're expected to believe the minister who is not using a resource because he said, I'm the, he said, I'm the rabbi, you believe what I say. Or I'm the teacher in the carrot assembly. You believe what I say. That's exactly what the pastor in the, Cal in the Christian church said. The Pentecostal church. I'm the pastor. You believe what I say. And don't bring those resource books. Because you're messing up my sermon and you're taking away my money. The rabbi, same thing. The teacher at the carrot assembly, the same thing. <laughs> they do not like when one of their sheep brings a howitzer to the church or to the synagogue. They don't like it because it takes away their power. It takes away their control. I encourage you strongly to get your own copy of the Concordance and get some of these books that I just mentioned. They're available in bookstores and they're available online. If you do not know how to get them, I will give you the ISBN numbers. Put a message in the comments. What is the ISBN of such and such book? I will give it to you. You can go to Amazon or any other book place, Barnes and Noble and Abe's Books, etc. etc. Et and you can look it up and buy it. They're not that expensive. You become the howitzer when your minister is telling you lies. You shoot the howitzer at your minister and by God I don't mean literally I'm not asking you to go shoot the minister. Do not take that as what I said. I'm talking about the book being the howitzer. You present facts to your minister, to your rabbi, to your teacher. And you say, excuse me, rabbi, that is not the definition of the word you, of what you just said. Excuse me, pastor, the word you just said and the definition you gave, that is not the definition. You become the howitzer for your minister's false teachings and false doctrines. It's the only way to protect yourself. Thank you very much for this watching my video. Hit like and subscribe and share this with your friends.